I want to give you just a little bit of history on uh, Pulpit Freedom Sunday back in 19, and back in 2008. Excuse me. Uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom saw what was happening in American churches. They were becoming silenced. They were being told what they could or couldn't preach. And uh, churches and pastors, in fact, to this very day, many, many pastors will not even hand out voter guides in the church for fear that somehow the IRS is going to swoop down and, and take them away. This past week, I get an annual letter when it's an election year uh, from a man named Barry Lynn who puts an REV in front of his name, but it, it holds no weight. And it's a letter threatening pastors that if they go ahead and preach that the IRS is probably going to come down and, and swoop down on them, just as I said, uh, and, and basically take away the rights of the church. Friends, I don't know if you've noticed, but we're losing the rights of the church anyhow. I, I refuse personally, as a servant of God, to be quiet and not speak. I don't choose to be rebellious for the sake of pure rebellion. I choose for the same reason. When you read Peter and John in Acts 4.19, their answer is, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to, or to him, really God. He said, You be the judge of that. Should I listen to man or should I listen to God? My answer is simple. I listen to God. A little further on down, a chapter later, chapter 5 in Acts, they're called again to account. And this is their response at that time. The apostles were brought in and they were made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in that name, he said. Yet you have filled the streets of Jerusalem with your teaching and you're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and John replied, we must obey God rather than man. I picked up off of the internet yesterday a story that breaks my heart out of Tallahassee, Florida of two Christian schools who were playing in the championship that were denied the right to pray over the loudspeaker because somebody in the crowd might be offended. Two Christian schools playing each other told they couldn't pray publicly. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Judge Roy Moore in Alabama. How many know several years back he would not remove the Ten Commandments from his courtroom. He was the Supreme Court Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court at the time. Charges were brought against him. He was removed from office because of that. The people of Alabama would have no part of that. They voted him back in and voted him into the position of Chief Justice again. The law of Alabama on their constitutional docket says that it is illegal for a man and a woman to be married, a man and a man, excuse me, to be married together. Judge Moore upheld that. The Supreme Court ruled by some floozy ruling. He continued to uphold it. They charged him again. The other day they removed him again for the second time. Only this time in, in typical progressive fashion. They chose to remove him until the end of his term, at which time he is not eligible to run again because of his age. They have single-handedly silenced him. Yesterday, officially, Sweet Case by, Mar by Marissa shut down all of their functions that they have. That's the couple that, that were, they would not do a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. And they were shut down because of that fine over $150,000. Oregon just passed a law becoming another state that allows marijuana sales. Colorado and others are already there. The Supreme Court is about to begin a brand new term, short of justice, which means that any case that comes before the court, whatever the original ruling was, if it's an even vote, 4-4, four, four, 
then that law stands. There are laws that are going to be coming before the court that okay sinful behavior. Friends, we are in trouble as a nation. Back in 1954, Lyndon Johnson didn't look to silence churches. That was not his intent to its purpose. He was trying to quiet Ellie Hunt, a, a millionaire who was coming against him with the 501c3, and, and in the process, he slipped back into Washington, and he wrote a provision, the Johnson Amendment, and as happens in Washington, D.C., he slipped it in a bill. Nobody reads the bills. They pass it in churches that fell under that, that standard. It has left the, the pulpit quiet in our nation, but that is not the history. If you read any of the comments that were shown in any of the videos, the founding fathers of our nation know they were not all Christians, but the documents that we have, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, are established on Christian principle and view. Many of them had made their quotes of the place of Christianity in our nation. From Plymouth Rock to this very day, to the, to the pre-revolutionary war era, pastors would stand in the pulpit and they would call out the tyranny of government. You've heard me mention the term Black Robe Regiment. They were pastors in the years just prior to the American Revolution. And they began to cry from the pulpit the Ill illegalities of the things that were being done to them by Britain. They began to call out the, the sinful things that were being made into taxes and into things that were wrong. And the British hated them for that and they labeled them the Black Robe Regiment and, and they basically, when the war started, they singled out pastors' families who had been involved, put as many of them to death or in prison as many of them as they could. And yet when I look at the closing document of, of the Declaration of Independence, the document that we stake everything on, it, these words are found there. It says, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. That's God. Yeah. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honors. That, that pledge was contingent on believing that the sovereign God was with them. That does not sound to me like an atheistic government. Many of those men and women paid with their life, lost children, lost homes, lost property, gave all they had just as they said that we could have the nation that we have today. So much so that John Adams, and, and, and John Adams was a strong Christian, in 1777, he wrote this, you will never know how much it cost this present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you will make good use of it. If you do not, I shall repent in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. How prophetic a statement is that that John Adams looked ahead and said, you'll never know what we paid to give you the freedom that you have the right to religion, the right to free speech, the right to be protected by the laws of land. You'll never know, he says, if you don't do right by it, I'll repent in heaven for having ever done the efforts that I put into it. I'm sure God doesn't feel a whole lot different than that. If you know the history of our nation from the pilgrims coming over, you know that God's hand has divinely protected our nation. God's hand has watched over our people. He has, there are battles that we have won in war that we should have been destroyed in. I'm sure it has to break the heart of God that he gave a nation to be a city on a hill, a beacon of light, a place from which the gospel could go out to the whole world so that Matthew 28, 18 and through 20 would be fulfilled, that we would go out into the whole world. It would come from this nation to watch today the things that are going on in the United States of America. 
Daniel Webster, this, this term, when I, when I read this quote, again, almost prophetic, listen to these words. If we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and to prosper. But if we and our posterity neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury all our glory in profound obscurity. Friends, that's where we are today. That's right, that's right. If America continues on the path that America is on, in a very short period of years, we will be so indebted in things, we will be so morally corrupt that people will not remember the history of a great nation raised up by God to do His bidding. They will remember a pathetic nation that has fallen in sin. Let me say this at the very start. No man can save America. Amen? Amen. Amen. No political party can save America. That we agree on. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. 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 Having said that, let me remind you that in that he has given us responsibility. That God has made a way for you and I to be able to have a voice in, in the occurrences in our nation, that we have a, a voice in the direction that our nation goes. That, that is so supremely different than most of the world's history. That God carved out a land where people could actually have a say and that their godly view could be heard and it would make a difference. Here are the freedoms, this is what they included. Freedom of speech. The right to declare a, a biblical worldview to a dying world. Do you know today that's getting to be where you can't do that? You, there are many, many places you cannot go and speak about Jesus. If you do, you are in violation of the law. And yet in America, that is what our freedom of speech, that is what the First Amendment gave to us. We ought to speak the truth in love, and love is critical. I know sometimes I sound angry when I talk or not. Love is critical because somebody so lost in sin is no different than me. But for the grace of God, there go I. You see, we have to understand that we are not better than anybody. We are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. The First Amendment of the United States prohibits the making of any laws respecting the estab an establishment of religion or impeding the free exercise thereof. That says two things to us. There'll be no Church of England like there was in England. Nobody will say you have to be Assembly of God or you can't have a religion. You can have whatever faith that you belong to in America. That, if you listen to some of the quotes of the founders, they say that was one of the goals of, of everything was we, we have our faith and our belief, but we hold true that others can practice their faith because Christians were not afraid that if the truth were revealed, that Christianity would not prevail. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The second thing that, that it was intended to do, quite honestly, was to say that the government could not pass laws that said a baker had to violate their conscience, that said an owner of a company had to give something out that violated his faith. It was never intended to say to a believer, you can practice your faith in your little building. But once you walk out of the doors into our world, you've got to play by our rules. No, that the first time, I remember a while back when there was an event out west with the Bureau of Land Management, where somebody had come along and put up posts and made a little square with cones and it said First Amendment Zone. <laughs> you know what the First Amendment Zone is? Canada, Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Pacific Ocean, and all there is. You see, you have the freedom to practice your faith. This is what we are losing in our nation. We also have another freedom that, that 
Church, I'm going to be honest with you. I get mad when I read the statistics on how many elections were lost because Christians did not vote. I get angry because I've heard people say, oh, God's going to do what he's going to do anyhow. Well, fine, and just sit in your closet, don't do anything, and be the guy when the Lord returns and he asks for the talents that you pull yours out and say, I didn't get my dirty or anything, Lord, here it is. No, he, he called us to be a voice. He called us to be a light. Somebody's morality is going to legislate the laws of this land. When I ran this year for Congress, I ran because I wanted to stand in the Congress and be able to give a Christian point of view because you can hear anything else you want on the floor of our Congress today. Freedom to elect our, our officials. Supreme Court Justice John Jay, he, one of the three men that were most responsible for the framing of the Constitution, said this, Providence has given our people the choice of their rulers, and it's the duty as well as the privilege and the interest of a Christian, of a Christian nation, to select and to prefer Christians for their rulers. Now, today that statement would be declared so out of bounds. What he is saying, the nation was founded on Christian principles and a Christian should want Christian leadership. They should want somebody who's going to, to bring in godly views that we're not going to be pressed in our faith to walk in opposition to God if we step in the way. Freedom to, to practice our faith. I'm not going to tell you how long it's going to take, but I'm going to tell you that we are heading in a direction, and this comes directly from the General Superintendent of the Assembly of God, that we are going to lose the freedom to meet and do what we're doing in this building today. There, there are laws that are being pressed right now through the United Nations to declare that, that anyone who says the things that a Christian would about certain aspects of sin would be hateful and out of the bounds of human behavior. But you and I can sit back now and think, that'll never happen. That's happening, and it's happening right before our eyes. I wouldn't be up here today doing what I'm doing if I didn't realize the danger that our country was in. I don't have a wish to be in trouble. They're, they're sending to churches people to sit in the church and, and report on what pastors are saying. There, there are people in churches today, I, I know almost everybody here, but there, there are people being sent to churches to report back on what's going on. They don't have to report back. When I get done today, I will burn this sermon on a DVD and mail it to the IRS this week. Because the IRS doesn't have the right to tell a Christian what can be said. You know what my hope is, honestly? The, the, they say maybe 4,000 pastors this year. My hope is that they actually listen to those sermons when they get them. And somebody comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. Freedoms have been exercised properly. Great things have happened in our nation. You, you, they go back a few years. The elections we won where conservatives were elected that were pro-life and pro-Christian. Those were the years that, that Christians voted. When they didn't vote, it, it wasn't only detrimental to our nation, but it's detrimental to the kingdom of God. When a Christian doesn't vote and, and, and a nation that has been granted that kind of liberty loses that liberty, it is detrimental to the kingdom of God. It takes away from somebody the right to hear the gospel. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When a nation walks upright with God, it's, it's a blessing to God, but sin is a reproach to any people. Let me give you the statistics on voting. And this is, I, I got to be honest with you, I was tempted. There's a, there's a group that you can send the churches, you know, the, whatever you call it, directory in. 
And they can check and tell you how many people in your congregation are or are not registered. You know, unfortunately, in our world today, I don't know about it. lately right now, I, I just signed up for Medicare the other day. I, I, I got tired of getting things in the mail. I mean, like there were like hundreds of them coming, telling me you're turning 64 or 65. In our world today, information is out there. But I listened to a pastor who shared, and he said, I was so sure my whole congregation was registered to vote. I said, sure, I've had to do it. He said, I found out I had 31% of my congregation that were registered to vote. <laughs> Friends, when the Christian isn't registered to vote, the devil wins. Let me, let me give you the statistics. Between 25 to 35% of Christians are not registered to vote. So between two and four out of every ten Christians just simply have never registered to vote. They've formulated some theology that says that's against my religion. Forty percent of Christians that are registered to vote don't vote in presidential elections. If if the, if fifteen percent they say of the Christians who are not registered to vote would have voted in the last two elections, we would have had a, a, a different president. How do, we, how do we sit back silent and then come here and complain about what's going on in our country where we didn't do anything about it? I go weary of people all parents of the country and says, what are we doing about it? What you, as a Christian, what are you doing? How many times when you, how, I'm not going to ask you this. This is a, a hypothetical question. How many people stopped buying at Target when Target did a transgender thing? No, I'm not asking you that, honestly. I did, and I still I haven't been back there since. Amen. But I can tell you there's a lot of Christians going, oh, there's just too many things. I wouldn't have anything to buy. All good. And when your little child is in there and somebody comes in right. and they molest them, don't come to me and say, I need counsel. Okay, I would counsel. Don't get me wrong. But don't come to me at a time like that and complain. See, church, this is where we're at. 75% of Christians Registered to vote, don't vote in non-presidential general elections. So what they're saying is once every four years they vote. There, it could be a general election for senators, congressmen, for you know important dockets of constitutional changes to the state constitution. But I don't vote, I only vote in the presidential year. We're, we're letting all of these things be impacted and put into place. 95% of Christians registered to vote, don't vote in primary elections. If I had continued to stay in the race, if 95% of Christians don't go to the primary, and I'm running as a Christian pastor, how many know my chances go way down? You see, there are, there are people of God who are willing to put their neck in the noose, but somebody else has got to be willing to stand behind them. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I, I, I love the story of his life, of his courage. But I have one phrase by him that most of you know that, that sticks out. Silence in the face of evil is, is itself evil. God will not hold guilt, us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. If I just don't do anything, I'm guilty. Friends, I would rather stand here today and have somebody march through the door and take me out in handcuffs for, for speaking the truth than to be silent today and say, well, I don't want us to lose our tax exempt status. You see, the tax exempt status doesn't provide for this church. God does in faithful times. If you know anything about history, and I, I, I hate the fact that most people hate history. How many don't like history? Be honest. Okay, good point. <laughs> I, I, I love, even when I was a bad kid growing up, I loved history. And, and I studied things like, like the Magna Carta and how, how that came into being and how Prince John was 
for a time on the throne in England, and now the land barons and the, and the Archbishop of Canterbury got tired of getting ripped off, and they said, we're not going to take it. We're writing this document called the Magna Carta, and, and we're going to sit down with you, and King, you're going to do it. And they sat down together, and it provided for the freedom of religion, and, and, and it was signed off on it for a period of time. It actually worked. Because men know innately inside that their rights don't come from government, their rights come from God. Amen. The Mayflower Compact, when our Pilgrim families first came over there, here's what it says. Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. How many will say that's not vague? Right? That's not vague. For, for the undertaking for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, we have voyaged to plant this first colony in the northern part of Virginia, do by those present solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, we covenant and combine ourselves together in a civil body politic for the better order and preservation and furtherance of the ends of war. Said those three words, civil body politic, are, are people saying a government, as a government, we, we bind together as a people. What did we bind together as a people? We did it in the presence of God. We did it undertaking for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. It is spelled out what their purpose was. There's nothing vague about the foundation of, of our nation. And, and truly that shouldn't surprise anybody because we follow, if you will, the Judeo-Christian principles, both of the Old Testament and the New Testament. When, when the Assembly of God allowed me to do the conference a few weeks ago, people were shocked when I said Moses wasn't a religious leader. Oh yes, he was. He wrote the day. No, Moses was a civic leader. His brother Aaron was the religious leader. And they went hand in hand together. And when, and when Moses took on Pharaoh, if you will, down, down in Egypt, that was, that was a civic leader taking on a government to, to oppose what they were doing. His brother Aaron was there on the religious side to represent that. The Ten Commandments was both a civic law and a spiritual law. Okay, and how many know the Ten Commandments work even with unbelievers? Right? I mean, if you don't have any idols, you're, you're better off. If you honor your father and your mother, your life is going to go better. You know, right? Some of you parents have said, I brought you into the world. I'll take you. <laughs> yeah, you all, you all know that one. Yeah. Elijah's confrontation with King Ahab and Jezebel is a prophet of God against a, a government leader. Okay, all, all of this talk of pastor, we shouldn't do that. And that doesn't come from you, and I thank God for that. These are all biblical examples. Daniel being told that he could not pray went home and opened the windows and knelt down and he prayed. The three Hebrew children being told that they had to bow down to this idol, that would be no different than them saying that you've got to take a mark on your right hand or your forehead. We're not going to do it. Even if you put us to death, God can deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're not doing it. You see, these are, these are, this is the, the Christian heart in Scripture. This is what God ha has called us to be. You know, America from its origin was a nation of godly uh, precepts. I don't have the time to go through every monument, but if you get to Washington, D.C., go to the Lincoln Memorial, go to the Jefferson Memorial, Jefferson Memorial, go to the Supreme Court, go to all of these places. But the one I'd like to point out to you this morning is one that seats at the top of the tallest structure in Washington, D.C. It sits atop the Washington Monument. And from the top of that monument, you can look out over all of the most powerful city in the world. And on top of that monument are, are two words, Laos down. Anybody know what they mean? 
praise to God. Over the tallest building in Washington, where you can go and look over the entire city, praise to God. Does that sound like a nation that's not Christian? Friend, you and I, we have bought a lie and a bill of goods. We have been sold a bill of goods. We, we have an election coming up in 30 some odd days that I am going to tell you without apology will determine the future of this nation before God. I'm not even sure if the side that most strongly sides with the Christian view will be that great a help, how long it will put it off. But I can tell you right now that one side has already made the statement that Christians are going to have to learn to adjust their view because they don't fit with the world. I am asking you from the bottom of my heart, if you are not registered, get registered this week. I would love to be able to say 100% of our congregation. I don't care who you vote for. I do care who you vote for. But what I'm saying is my ultimate thought is that you use that power that God gave you. That you can do it. I, I want to do something. A, a, a few weeks back, I people, here, here's what I'm running into a lot. Well, both of the candidates are pretty ragged, okay? And I say, okay, I can, I can buy into that. Then we're all sinners saved, by the way, so or un unsaved, depending on where we're at. But what do the parties stand for? What are the what are the views of the party? What are the platforms of the parties? I took it, I put on the bulletin board out there just the Republican Party platform, the Democratic Party platform, and said, look at which one lines up with God's word and then vote how you think the Lord would have you. I'm going to show a video clip that gives you a, a comparison. You listen to where they stand because you're going to cast the vote and you're going to stand before God on the way you cast that vote. <laughs> Let's talk about party platforms. This might seem boring, but they're important. Every four years, Democrats and Republicans gather, and each writes a document to establish how they will govern. That document is called a platform. It's a big deal, because the platform defines what the parties believe and the policies they will pursue. Sure, there are times when politicians don't vote with their respective party platforms. Republicans vote with theirs nearly nine-tenths of the time. Democrats, nearly three-quarters. A very large amount of the time, what you see in the platform is what you get with your politician. So, let's take a look at the platforms. On our first freedom, the freedom of religion, the Democrat platform is silent on the right of Americans to live according to their beliefs outside the walls of their churches and places of worship. The GRD platform affirms the rights of conscience for all, and for the first time, the platform calls for a repeal of the 1954 Johnson Amendment, which effectively silenced churches on issues deemed political. On life, Democrats, for the first time, call for the federal government to force taxpayers to fund elective abortion. Democrats believe unequivocally that every woman should have access to safe and legal abortion. And to fund this access, their platform calls for repealing the Hyde Amendment. Republicans support an end to abortion and the funding of abortion. And the GOP supports a human life amendment to the Constitution. On marriage, Democrats embrace the redefinition of marriage, stating LGBT people have the right to marry the person they love. Republicans believe the cornerstone of society is natural marriage, the union of one man and one woman. On judicial appointments, Democrats promise to appoint judges who protect a woman's right to abortion and see the Constitution as a blueprint for progress. Republicans support judges who respect traditional family values and the sanctity of innocent human life. They seek to enable courts to begin to reverse the long line of activist decisions. 
on school choice, Democrats offer no support for families who want private or faith-based schooling for their children. The GOP platform supports homeschooling, private or parochial schools, and vouchers. These things matter, and that little R and that little D next to a candidate's name, that says a lot. The parties are telling you what they will do. The question is, now that you know, what will you do? Friends hat is it in a nutshell. Forget the names of the parties. Think about what they stand for. Which one of those do you think that the Lord would stand with? Our country is at a crossroads. And I can hear the words of, of the prophet Jeremiah when he says this uh, in verse 15 in chapter 6. Were they ashamed because of the abominations that they'd done? They were not ashamed at all. They did not even blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At, the, at that time I will punish them. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, stand by the way and see and ask for the ancient path where the good way is and then walk in it and you will find rest for your soul. God said very simply that a people can get so deep in sin that they don't even feel shame over their behavior anymore. But God said there's still a way out there that is right that will lead to life, that will lead to Him and to the cross. And He's encouraging you and I to take that path. Today, a couple thousand pastors across the country are doing what I'm doing. We don't know that we won't be arrested. We don't know that we won't be charged with something. What we do know is that if the truth isn't told somewhere, people are going to continue to buy into a lie. Church, God is the creator of human government. He's not some helpless, you know, bystander. God is not somebody who is silent on what is going on in the world around it. How is it that with the right to vote, that, that we have been given, that we remain silent in this nation. How is it that so many times we'll do the tisk tisk sound, but we do nothing about it? The ancient path is out there. The ways of God are clear. God has called you and I to walk in those ways and to be His voice. Failure, I would say at this point in history, is going to lead to a catastrophe. Now, I want you to know this, that Satan has a purpose and a goal in this story. How many know that? A lot of people who don't follow Twitter or things like that didn't catch this. But this week, the United Nations tweeted out a tweet. And throw that one up there, Tom, if you can. Here's what it said. Eight million Americans abroad could stop Trump. This tool can make sure that they all vote, share, and retweet. The United Nations was saying, we have got to stop Trump. Since when does the United Nations vote in the government of the United States of America? Less than an hour later, a, a second tweet came out, and here's what it said, and it was real and typical. An errant tweet has been deleted from this account. The cause is being investigated. Our official site for the UN News is, and they go on, friends, they do it, what they do every time. They get their message out, and then they pull it back and say, oh, we're so sorry. You know what, that's like when your kids do something wrong and they say, Mommy, I'm really sorry, and Daddy, I'm really sorry, and you know full well they're not. There's a world that's pulling for the end, not, not of America just as America, but that city set on a hill, that light that sends the gospel out into the world. It's driving, if you will, towards a one world government. When, when, when Britain pulled out of the European Union in free exit, they were angry at them because they, they were messing up their plan for a one world government. There's a spiritual, demonic move to bring about that world. But I say to you and I today that, that we have got to stand our ground. 
we have got to be the voice that God would have us to do. The book of Nehemiah, in a few minutes I'll close, the book of Nehemiah tells about a nation that God loved that fell in the ways. And it caused them to be overtaken by an enemy and their cities were run down. I, I don't know if you've seen Detroit lately, but Detroit, when you show pictures of Detroit, it looks like a, a, a city in the Middle East. God raised up Nehemiah to go back and to challenge and to charge those people in Jerusalem to, to stand up, to raise up, to do something about it. He comes back there. He, he knows Sanballat and Tobiah are the enemies of his actions. They're just, they're, they're, they were saying yesterday after Judge Moore was removed that, that the group that brought the lawsuit against him has already moved on to the next, to the next conservative judge. There, there's a group in America called Freedom From Religion that every time anything Christian is done, they're, they're putting in a lawsuit. There's the ACLU that is trying to drive God out of our nation. There, there are sand ballots and Tobias, but what happened in Nehemiah was the people heard the message. They heard that God was with them. They all began to do their part, and they were able to rebuild. Friends, if there's any hope for America, it's going to be when the church gets back to speaking up, standing up, praying up, being who God has called us to be. We have a voice. We have the right. What we do with it, we will stand before God on one day. This election is only one part of the picture. We need to pray for our we need to pray even for the leaders that you despise or dislike. We need to pray that God gets hold of their life. I wouldn't wish anybody to hell. We need to pray for men and women to wake up to the day that we're in. We need a private prayer life. And I, I, want, I hope this is a little convicting because I dare to say the average Christian doesn't have a daily prayer life. That's like saying you don't need during the day. We need to get back in our personal time of prayer. We need to get back to calling on the name of the Lord. We need to get back instead of just talking about the problems, talking to our Heavenly Father. We need to be a, a, a little bit of a, of a voice. We need to speak out more when, when we see issues come up. We need to sign the petitions. We need to be active. They need to know that there are believers in America that don't believe the way this country is going is the right way. I challenge you again this election to vote. I can't make you vote. But I would tell you, if your reason was you didn't have a ride, I would come pick you up. I would take you to the pole. So if you don't have a ride and that's your excuse, I will take you to the pole. Because friends, this country is on the verge of collapse and we will one day stand before God for the ways that we've allowed things to go. Dirk, I'm gonna have you come up in a minute. Just, to, I'm gonna show one last video with some comments by our founding fathers. Sorry about that. And then I'm gonna have Derek, when that is playing, if you want you, you're free to come on. I have carefully examined the evidences of the Christian religion. And if I was sitting as a juror upon its authenticity, I would unhesitatingly give my verdict in its favor. I can prove its truth as clearly as any proposition ever submitted to the mind of man. Alexander Hamilton. The future and success of America is not in this Constitution, but in the laws of God upon which this Constitution is founded. James Madison. The reason that Christianity is the best friend of the government is because Christianity is the only religion that changes the heart. Thomas Jefferson. The Bible is the rock upon which this republic stands. Andrew Jackson.
It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. Patrick Henry If we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and to prosper. But if we and our posterity neglect its instruction and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury all our glory in profound obscurity. Daniel Webster. Top of that building again, I'll say it, the words of Miles Nails, praise to God. Church, our nation is in trouble. They need believers to be a voice. They need Christians to be on the school boards. They need Christians to be in civic government making a difference. We need to be Christians with the school that John spoke about. Because that's a completely different connection. But if it's we as believers will stand up and support a school like that and help that school survive and let them see the difference with Christ, we can change schools in our nation. I'm going to challenge you this morning just to pray. Just ask God, God, is there something I can do beyond just voting? Is there something I can do? Is there somewhere I can serve? Is there some way I can make my voice known that God would take and use my life? I want you to back in. There's a time to hold your tongue, time to keep your head down. There's a time, but it's not now. Sometimes you gotta go.